perhaps you've heard one of our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters ask this question. Do you know our Lord Jesus Christ, or do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And um, I've heard sometimes um, Catholics kind of throw that uh, question off as something that Protestants say or something. But I think there's something really valuable in that question. First of all, as, as you know, we know people on different levels. And sometimes that can change. And sometimes there are multiple levels, you know. I think of the, uh, some, the bishop is supposed to be um, brother, uh, father, uh, friend to his priest, you know. Sometimes it's hard to juggle all that. But I remember, um, you know, my teachers at Northern, I knew them as teachers, you know. And then later when I went back to teach, I got to know them in a different way as colleagues, you know. And so we can know Jesus as a person and most of the time when someone first comes to know Jesus it seems like that's how they know him that somehow Jesus becomes real to them as a real person and we can know Jesus as Lord we have an example of that in the gospel you know there are quite a few examples in the gospels that's kind of the point of the gospels but today we see the apostles, after Jesus does this wonderful um, thing, gets back in the boat, wind comes down, and they fall to their knees, and they say, clearly, you are the Son of God. They experienced in Jesus the power of God, the divine power, so they knew him there as Lord. And I think it's valuable come very valuable actually to come to know Jesus as Savior although that's a little harder to do and as a way of getting <coughs> into that it's good to note or it seems to me that our salvation comes in two movements you might say the first of course is through Jesus' paschal mystery, his suffering and death and rising, the world is redeemed, right? We're set free from original sin, set free from the power of, I shouldn't say original sin there, actually, we're set free from the power of sin and death and evil. And we come to appropriate that for ourselves in baptism. That's when we're set free from original sin. And become adopted sons and daughters but that's hard to know we can know about that like intellectually but I have no idea of course I was baptized when I was a few days old so I, I, I don't know what it felt like to be enslaved and be stained with original sin you know even those of you who are older I'm not sure that's something we know what it feels like right so it's something that happens to all of us, right? Redemption was for all. But the second movement of salvation seems like is more <coughs> personal and comes later. Now just, uh, here's one little thing. What we heard in the collect this morning. <coughs> Bring, we pray, to perfection in our hearts the spirit of adoption as your sons and daughters. And so that certainly implies that we at one point are adopted as sons and daughters, but that adoption needs to be brought to perfection. And so all of us need more work, if I can put it that way, right? Because of our sin. Even though we're set free from original sin, we're still left, the church teaches us, with what she calls concupiscence, the wound of sin, which makes us um, um, more likely to sin. <coughs> if you think, you know, if you, I've sprained my ankle about 20 times in my life, 
And by now, it's just really weak. I mean, it's ready to be strained, sprained at any time. So concupiscence is that kind of openness to sin. It's a wound from original sin. And so we prayed this morning that our adoption may be brought to perfection. So <coughs> we're approaching the place where Jesus is Savior. And this is where we find him, is not just in our sin, but in our inability not to sin. I don't know if you know that place or not yet. If you are serious about your walk with Jesus, sooner or later you'll come to that place. Especially if you use the sacrament of reconciliation. Some don't for various reasons. I, I'm not always completely sure why. I can think of three or four reasons why someone might not use the sacrament of reconciliation. But those who use it, and I've been sitting in that room for 14 years, and I know from my own life as well, sooner or later, we all seem to come to this place where we're confessing the same sin. Yes, we might on occasion vary it a little. We might uh, fall into things that are unusual for us. But all of us sooner or later have those things with which we struggle regularly. And sometimes it seems like we'll struggle with it for the rest of our lives. And we're getting very close at that place. We're getting close where Jesus comes to us as Savior. And so it could be all kinds of things, right? I mean, we were all group as a group redeemed by Christ's action on the cross. But individually now, we all have personal things that need to be redeemed. And so we might have a quick temper. We can't seem to control our temper. Or we might um, not, we might overeat. We might not seem to be able to eat um, um, healthily or something. Or we have a problem with alcohol. Can't stop drinking. Or we're arrogant or we're quick to criticize all the time or we're gossips. Or maybe we don't say things that aren't necessarily true, but we're detractors. We say things that are true, but nobody needs to hear. It just tears somebody down. We might be prideful, you know, and, and be easily uh, have our pride pricked, be overly sensitive, all kinds of things. You know them as well as I do. When you find yourself confessing the same sin, what you realize is, I can't seem not to sin, not to do this thing. And that's the place where Jesus comes to us as Savior. If we read the Gospel story a little bit allegorically, so Peter gets out of the boat, he's doing something that he cannot do on his own power. He's walking on the water. Clearly, that's a power that's being given to him from whom? From Jesus, from God. But he looks around then. Instead of looking in faith at Christ, he looks around and he sees the wind and the waves, and he sinks. And then he does the smartest thing that anyone can ever do. He yells out, Lord, save me. Notice, he didn't say, James, John, Philip, save me. He says, Lord, save me. And at that place, whatever your sin is, where you seem to do this over and over, you seem not to be able to not sin this way, that's the place where we need Jesus' power. Because clearly, we've come to the end of our power. We've come to the end of our abilities. We're insufficient to grow in holiness further than that place. 
And that's where we need Jesus. And that's where we come to know Jesus as Savior. And that moment of temptation is where we can know him as Savior. And this is one of those things that I'm still working on with you. Here and there, I've had some success. But what I notice is my failure is a failure to stop and ask the Lord's help right then at that moment. For whatever reason. Maybe it's happening too quickly or I'm not, uh, I haven't been praying, I'm not really co conscious of God that much. Or maybe it's just willfulness, whatever it is, or weakness. But in my weakness, I don't call out to the Lord. But when I do, I've had success, right? And I realized that not sinning there was not on my power. It was on Jesus' power. And it seems to me we have to come to this place. And we have to do this. Think about this. In heaven, no evil can exist, right? We cannot get to heaven until we are sinless, until we are this perfection, this, this adoption in us has been perfected. We pray that, right? Why do we ask for perfection in our hearts, the spirit of adoption? That we may merit to enter in the inheritance which you have promised. Here's an interesting uh, meditation for you to try sometime. Imagine yourself sinless. I've tried to do this. It's very difficult for me anyway. It might be easier for you, probably will be. But imagine myself with no sin. Imagine myself, I, I imagine myself not even desiring anything sinful. <coughs> I, I can't do it. I, I just, I don't know what it looks like or feels like. I can maybe intellectually somehow uh, imagine it. But I can't really get there, if I can put it that way. But we have to be sinless to come into our inheritance. How are we going to do that? That purification, we can go so far on our own, right? We do have work to do. We just don't sit there and say, Jesus, don't let me sin. You know, you know we keep away from the near occasion of sin. We um, distance ourselves from those friends who seem to pull us into sin. You know, we um, keep from whatever it is. We do our best. But when we reach the end of our best, we've still got a ways to go, most of us anyway, before we can reach that perfection of adoption that will allow us to come into heaven. And that's the place where Jesus is Savior for us individually. That's where each of us can come to know our Lord as Savior. And in a funny sort of way, this place where we're likely to sin Although it causes us sorrow and shame or embarrassment or whatever it causes us. At the same time, it can be a moment of great wonder and great grace and great gratitude. Because if we allow Jesus to be Savior for us there, we see the wonder of God's grace. And so I encourage you, at that moment when you're about <coughs> to sin, and I thought this yesterday, I think I may just even use these actual words, Lord save me, as a way to start. You know. But Lord save me. Because at that moment you realize I'm up against the end of my abilities. I need a savior. And that's when we know for ourselves, in our hearts, <coughs> Not just intellectually that Jesus redeemed the world, which is fine to know, it's good to know, and give thanks for. But in our hearts then, we come to know Jesus as our personal Savior. And so I really encourage you, I pray for you, that you take your sin seriously, first of all. But that secondly, at that moment, you don't give up. 
You don't rely just on your own efforts. But you call on Jesus. Lord, save me because I can't do this on my own. 